Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of catching up with the magnificent Mr. Mike Watt. Yay! Thanks, Raul, for having me back again. Thank oh, you so much. My pleasure, Mike, my pleasure. Well, we were just looking back. The last time we chatted was 2018, and quite a whirlwind of world events and everything has happened since then. So kind of on general terms, for people that want to know what we talked about then, go back and see that, but I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> we'll pick up where we left off. What have you been up to since 2018, Mike? Well, because of that whirlwind, music really was a lifeline for me. I know that the Internet's kind of duplicit, right? You uh -huh. can spread lies and haze, but you can also collaborate. And I made a lot of records with people. I haven't even met in person. I was up doing up to five shows a week of my Watt from Pedro show. Mm -hmm. I've been doing 21 years, seven months now. So during the situation, for 14 months, I was doing five a week. So over 300 guests right in that little block. And then when things got more healthy, did a tour with Mike Begetta, Steve Hodges as, as MSSB. 48 gigs, 48 days, last March, April. 10,000. 580 miles, I drove every one of them. Oh, wow. Well, this bad me, you know, that's totally kaput now. It was on its way down, and I couldn't schlep the gear, so I was feeling guilty. So at least I could be the wheel man, right? Mm -hmm. There's, these these uh, calluses are from bass strings. These are from the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big country, you know. But it's interesting, and uh, it was a good thing. I was very careful. I mean, you know going around town to town, that situation, but everybody stayed healthy, we played good. I mean, when situations come up, you, you see how valuable the arts are. Mm. Some ways, yeah, they don't put chow on the, well, they kind of do put chow on the table, <laughs> especially in my case. But it, it's a part of the human thing that I think is necessary. It, it does seem a little frivolous, but in some ways, you know, as far as like making good connects with your fellow human beings, Mm -hmm. There's nothing like the arts. And especially when the reality of the dealio can be heavy and make things kind of despair. Absolutely. Well, and we we saw it, it was kind of the, the scattering of all different approaches. You had people that be, if they dedicated themselves purely to touring before yeah. the pandemic, some were just, they got creative and right away did that project they had in in mind something they had on on the burner one that always comes to mind of course lee sklar put out his book full of photos yeah. but a lot of other people started collaborating and sending tracks and right. they're like okay if we can't all be in one place at least thanks to the internet we can kind of keep working or they got writing to see what they were going to come up with when things kind of started opening up but the impact it had on the public as well was was very interesting because it made them realize in a lot of instances that they've really missed music. Yes. And so the feedback I've been getting from a lot of the players post pandemic is that they feel the excitement and the energy that the crowd is bringing is yes. renewed to a level that had kind of dwindled before the pandemic. Or like a taking a grip for granted kind of thing. Yeah. And they feel more appreciated. They, uh, in, in one individual had told me that it seemed like they were more willing to pay uh, the ticket to get into venues because it had been such a scarce thing before. You know, like before they'd have to put on like free shows. But yeah. now people were going, hey, I'll chip in because I appreciate being able to experience this again. So I'm not just looking for that freebie anymore. And I think a lot of interesting statements musically came out of the situation with the world, whether you had people, especially some of my favorite ones were more along the punk side where they were, you know, in voice of protest of, yeah. you know, why aren't you doing better with this? Or what, you know, let, let's speak our mind out here. And that also, I think, was important for 
the listening public to that maybe they felt isolated and by themselves that they could realize, hey, I'm not the only frustrated person here. <laughs> it's it's a universal reality. Yeah, yeah, lots of things to share. But, lots of things to share. And, Sometimes and we, all things, but uh, what do you call it? The silver lining trip, the lemonade maker, right? When it starts raining lemons. Yeah. Got involved with the project. Said, call it the lemonade makers. Because if all you do is sit and complain, if you can make a work of art out of that complaint, okay. Mm -hmm. But just to complain, I could see, you know, letting off steam. But then it gets a little boring. Do something about it. Do something. Yeah, yeah. Let it be a motivator, an instigator. Totally. About life and the, our takes on it. But I think that's what the arts are for, is kind of sharing these kind of personal takes to see. Because we've got so much in common. Well, at the same time, like you said, we all got individual voices. And then these situations come up and maybe make that more intense. But maybe, uh, yeah, you take stock of what is valuable and what is just superfluous. Oh, those gigs will always be there. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and looping back to the Bagetta Keltner Watt project, you have a new album, the recent album, Every When You Go. Yeah. <laughs> I get his idea. He's the boss. <laughs> I had to make sure I wrote that correctly because the brain wants to correct it and go everywhere you go, but it's every when you go. Yeah. It's Tell ironic or something. Yes, yes. Tell us about this project. I understand it was like one mega day in the studio. Well, like the first one, like the way I met Mike Begetta, why I, I, when I first got a chance to play with the Jim Keltner, mm -hmm. which to me is a big high point in my life, Wall of Flowers maybe four years ago, mm -hmm. five years ago, actually put together by the studio boss, producer, Chris Schlar, Big Ego in North Long Beach here at SoCal. He's going to start a label, and the way Mike Begetta brings it to me is like, Mike Begetta, will you make a record for my label? Okay, Chris Schlar, but I'll do it if you can put together a band that's got Jim Keltner and Mike Watt. I didn't know about this till after the fact, okay. So I meet this guy who's 20 years younger, right? He's in his early 40s at the time. And then Jim Keltner. Yeah. And I know all about Jim Keltner. I know nothing about Mike, you know, although except that he's earnest. And he's got this stack of music paper. So he's got us running down these charts. And some of the stuff is changing every two bars, the tempo, all kinds of crazy shit. And a couple hours of wrestling that, he said, forget this, man. I'll show you some of these little temas I got. One was when I was in the hospital sick, so it means a lot to me. And then we'll just improvise. So that's what Wall of Flowers becomes. Mm. Out of that one day. And then Chris Larb mixes it, comes out, Mike Begetta wants to tour it. Mr. Keltner's an older man now, not really tour it. So that's where we get Steve Hodges from my first opera, Contemplate the Engine Room, 27 years ago. And 26 years ago to take his place. And that starts a whole new project. Even though two out of three of the members are the same, it's completely different the way it's put together, the way it runs, everything. MSV, Main Street Style. Well, there was extra stuff Raul left from that first day for Wall of Flowers. So when we're doing that tour with Hodge, to promote Wall of Flowers where Mr. Keltner can't be there, mm -hmm. spirit, he puts together a second album with all them outtakes, them piece. Oh, wow. And Jim Keltner, he, he sends it, Jim Keltner. Mr. Keltner says, um, you know, it's okay and stuff, but if we're going to do another record, let's do another record. Which I'm way into. When he yeah. said that, it was like, because I was happy with the, any experience I shared with that man because it was so beautiful. And then Mike, too, this is the way I got to get to know him. I knew he, somebody explained to me, he's from the Nels Klein School. And he is. Neil Klein has done so much for guitarists, you know, and, and, and Bill Frizzell, Mark Rabot. I mean, all these guys letting the freak flag fly. It, it really incredible, these guitarists that are opening up so that you don't have to be a genre. You can just play guitar and it can be whatever. Mm -hmm. it's the way I thought when I heard Sonny Chirac, you know, or. Uh, anyway, anyway. 
Now, Clyde making the world safe for guitars to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Slave to genre, or like, oh, you want me to sound like him? No, it's be you. Yeah. React to this music and rhythm section can bring. That's what I felt. I was just saying, because when I hear Mike McKenna, I hear a little bit of surf too. But anyway, this time, okay, I'm going to set up another thing, Watt. So me and you are going to come in with Jim Keltner. He brings his own drums, sets him up. 80 years old, right? Wow. Something. This time, Mike Begetta brings in two tunes, but they're not on charts. He's going to play them for us because he learned something, I guess, from that first. And he asked why, myself, you bring it. So I write him one. Then I think two or three of the other ones was improvised in the moment. Well, first thing, I bring in the bass that I haven't played in 18 years. Right? I used it for the first Stooges gig at Coachella in 2003. I used it a lot in the 90s when I did that tour with Ed Vedder and Dave Grohl. And, but by the end of the 90s, the big scale playing that thing at gigs was destroying my hands. That's when I had to, like 98, 99 is when I go to the short scale for gigs. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the body's on a journey. Yeah. It's Clark tells me. Incredible cat. It teaches so much. So anyway, I do play it at the Coachella gig. I thought it was going to be one gig. I didn't know I was going to do 125 months of help in the Stooges, okay? Wow. No idea. What Months was like... So anyway, I brought this bass from those days. And I, I, I remember putting on the... One of those things called the old days letter set where you wrote on the pe with a pencil on the back of them to impress. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had the same letters that I used, but they were the white version, because the black version is what we used from the Minuteman logo. I still had that, but the white one, so I put them on the base. Of course, some came off right away, because <laughs> it's just, you know. And, and I played the gig with it, and then I never played again. Part of the problem, you know, the nine-inch headstock, this is the non-reverse ones, right? They way out there. Mm. Well, you know, I'm right-handed. But the port hand here, this muscle got <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we lost Brother Dusty Hill. Mm. Uh, that was a big blow to watch. I actually got to meet him and the whole band, the Billy and Fred, in Monaco. Stooges and CZ opened up for the Prince of Monaco. Wow. <laughs> Strange gigs. <laughs> but anyway, I got to meet him. Dusty it was like he had 10 thumbs. <laughs> Short fit, but he could play. Oh, man, could he play. Little man, but man, fire plug, fire plug, it's just incredible. And I've done this guy since the seventies, since that Trace Ombres. When you open up, there's that great show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But but I just loved his playing. I loved the parts he made up. I loved the way he played. He just made Billy and Frank look so good. He said, and he's a great singer, man, too. I think he sung Tush. I think that was his. Mm. Anyway. Uh, you know, they got a little corny there with the synthesizers and stuff. But, man, in the 70s, I saw them blow away Aerosmith, this little power trio. Wow. Frank had the little four-piece, you know, and they had the two microphones up front real close. And that's it on these huge arena rock stages, right? No pink cowboy suits yet, you know. <laughs> Still brown ones. But anyway, I met the man, and he had a big effect on me, you know, and he has all during the year. So as a tribute... To bring back, I thought, if I'm going to bring back the Thunderbird bass, you know, I already played it that way in the 90s with the humbucker, you know, the original pickup, and then I also put on board preamps on there and all that kind of stuff. Terry, take it all out, Watt, and get have Curtis Novak, who's wrapped me a lot of pickups, wrap me a 51 single core. I've never had a bass with a single core. Oh, nice. You know, and yeah, there's that hum, right? But there's something else about playing a single coil, especially if the band's noisy enough, you don't hear that shit anyway. Mm -hmm. and I go down the tone to 5-5, five, five, double nickels. And, you know, unless it's a quiet ballad, you don't really hear that shit anyway, you know? But, but there's something about the punch. Something really different. Anyway, I put this pickup in there. Of course, the pick guard don't match. Mm -hmm. right? It's a big hole for the original. Yeah. I meet this cat, uh, what's this, talkbase.com, right? Mm-hmm. There's an old timey bass, and a lot of it's like, oh my god! But yeah. some there are some good cats though. 
real good cats. And there's a, his name's Scott Rochester. And I just, he, he's in love with non-reverse Thunderbirds. Yeah. Like, maybe about like 650 of these things. But anyway, he loves them. He said, what, I'll cut you a pick guard. The day before I go to the studio to record with Jim Keltner and Mike Baguetta, it comes in the mail. Wow. Unseen, he just cuts it. He just figures it out. You know, well, Leo made the pickup this size, and it should go like kind of right here. And he just goes for it. Wow. I've already mounted it in the body, right? I kind of put it in that little cavity they got. Damn, if it don't fit just like that. <laughs> yeah. Just like that. So I get the screws in there. I come in the studio, uh, Big Ego in North Long Beach. Jim Keltner's, hey, Mike, good to see you again. He says, Mike. He sees the, the bluey, right? The thunder. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't play bass, but if I played bass, I would play one like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way this guy is. Most guys, you know, they get good at something, and it's like a chip on the show, and you know, it's kind of tuned or something. Mm. But this man, this man's the most gentle. This man's like, come on, come on. Yeah. It's just the way you would think a perfect music sitch is. You know, everybody's kind of scared. At the same time, kind of excited what's going to happen. And you don't have to worry about being threatened by some kind of sports motif or something, you know, c c competitive or yeah. whatever, pissing contest, or some people call it, whatever. Jim Keltner is not about this at all. And, of course, Mike knows how to run a session. I know be, being on tours with him, even though younger man, wise beyond his years, he knows how to run a band, too. Of course, being the boss, you can tell people what to do. But do you get the best performances? Mm. It's an art, like a basketball coach, right? Sure. The best players don't make the best coaches. Phil Jackson, right, a lot of rings, wasn't the greatest player. But there's art to, like, bringing things out of people. Mm -hmm. Be the butter man. Get the most out of your keel, most out of your bow, the most out of your hull, your mask. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. You're part of it, but you also can kind of see it, you know, because I really think about music important part is taking turns so I've been in those roles so I, I'm learning from them too so it comes down to jamming and playing now we've played with each other before four years ago so it's not this you know 90% of it just like who the fuck are you yeah well it's like wow you no know, I remember how you did that and I remember when I bring the Mike Baguette asked me to bring the tune out that I wrote called Yank It Out I, I use the title as the same as the motif, the main tema is it, bum, 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 so yank it out. I just thought it'd be easy for the group to identify with. And I, Mr. Keller, what do you think of this part here? And he goes, Mike, whatever you play makes me feel good. That's <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that, I melded. it. Mike Baguetta had, literally had to get a mop and mop my shit up off the deck, put me in a bucket. <laughs> to get it back together because I mean so kind of this man and you know the way the way he works with the tune too it was really interesting he listens to it he gets a thing they plays along with it and you can see him developing the dialogue that he wants to get going really really I know it was a session right a, a piece of work in this sure. but in a way Raul it was like a day in the classroom you know people pay for these kind of lessons absolutely <laughs> It was just beautiful. The way he, you know, I want to get something to make this work with you, you guys. You know, we're going to put this together. It was just so, not cocksure, like balls out conceited, but like really kind of positive thing. And, and the, like you got to feel around to find it. It's not automatically there, you know. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just something else about him. And, and you know, the whole idea of music of, uh, as when it's expressed as an ensemble, you know, like we were talking about the individual in the group, mm -hmm. you get there to try and make this 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 spoken thing, this voice coming from an ensemble. It's it, and, and you're at the bare data, right? Bass, drum, guitar, right? Really interesting. Really kind of you no know, uh, hiding. No things to baffle people with bullshit. You know, it's it, it, it's a trip. It's great, great experience for me. And then he does spiels too, why in between songs, because he's lived a life. Sure. So these stories. Maybe I don't want to play with Mr. Clapton, but. <laughs> 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 
I've always dreamed about Jack Bruce. You know, once I got, to, did I tell you last time about playing the Jack Bruce bass? No. I actually did. Wow. The guy brought me to Bruce Gary, the, the Knack drummer, right? He actually did fusion before New Wave. And wow. he played on a tour with Mick Taylor and Jack Bruce. And Jack Bruce traded him a Chapman stick and a thousand bucks for the cream bass. Oh, wow. I couldn't fucking believe it. Yeah, I go up there, you know, I'm seeing this tape of these guys, you know, he wasn't that bad, but Mick Taylor and Jack Bruce, it was not a good part of their lives, mm. as far as hell. And so they're just noodling with this fusion crap, you know what I'm saying? And finally he takes the VHS out and he comes and brings another one, it's the Albert Hall one. Albert Hall, he brings out this bass case. Mm. Well, there's marks on that bass in that last cream gig. You know, Derek Tribe's in the red cowboy shirt. I know this date. You know. These marks are on this bass, and there's a ladder. Oh, wow. No amplifier, but he let me play to the TV for a half an hour, and it played like a motherfucker. It was great. <laughs> and uh, an EV3, like early 60s, one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. And knobs wide part. It, man, it played so good. And sadly, he got uh, cancer and passed away. His family sold the bass. I found it on the internet. It was the bass. Oh, wow. I actually played the... So if anybody... Sometimes, yeah, you might have to sit through a lame-ass fusion. <laughs> but, you know, don't don't think you got it all figured out. You don't know what's up or, like that creed hung up around the bed. You don't know. <laughs> you know? And I ended up getting to play... Harvey Kubernick took me up there. He said, there's a guy who I think you should meet. Wow. Gary, and I had no idea that was going to happen but I got to play that bass. But getting back to the session here. Yes. Oh, the other thing about the the, the T-Bird, first for Watts since he was a boy, right? Flats. Oh. Now, I played some flat wilds on this little Hofner Beetle bass that I got to tour with Tav Falco. They're so tiny. In fact, I keep this bass by me where I can't because I can compose on it. It must weigh three pounds, you know? Yeah. You hear it? Great, 250 bucks. It's a Hoffner, but from China. I had to reverse the, the jack plate, but everything else I kept pretty much the same. It cut the notches a little deeper on the bridge because strings were hopping out. But pretty neat bass, man. Interesting. But then I got, you know, I got two other recorded basses that have round ones. So let's try flat ones. Well, the first set I got, Labella like this little ones, but man, they were like pipe. <laughs> but they got a little tension one. And those worked a lot better for me. Maybe it's just because of me. Yeah. But man, those other guys were like pipe. I got they were they were hurting my fingers a little bit. And then this Scott guy in Rochester, High, High Watt Scott, he goes by. He actually figured out because you know when they built those benches, they put it in the wrong place. Mm. So everything south of fuck, you know, the fifth fret is sharp. Yeah. See. So he he made a wider bridge it has adjustable saddles and all this crazy so he get, turned me on to one of them too yeah there's something about community i mean who would think there's a, a group of people out there working non-reverse t-birds yeah go figure <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah yeah it's just but it's the beautiful thing about the individual in the group a lot of times we, we, we turn I, I we need time together we need time alone but then there's times, you know, when they, they uh, inform each other. Mm -hmm. And now watch blue bases back in the race. Now I got three recording bases. Nice. The 6P base, the uh, 96 Moon base, uh, their grandma, and now the 66 non reverse T bird. Very cool. Well, and listening to everyone we go, you're absolutely right. It's a very. With with a trio, there's a very stable position. You see, like from all angles, I mean, it's kind of like a stool where your part comes through extraordinarily clearly. The drums are coming through extraordinarily clearly. The guitars coming through extraordinarily clearly. There's no curtains. There's no shrouds. It's just all right there, very very crisp and organic. And you did have a whole lot to do with filling that space too there was a lot of foundation and the tie-in between you and mr keltner locks in nicely and then it gives the guitar room to kind of flitter around 
uh, over that. So, you know, it, it's certainly quite the experience. And you know, it, it almost makes you think when you listen to it as if you'd spent the day in the studio listening to you guys just because it is so organic and so kind of right, like right there. So I would call it a success. Eh? Absolutely. So for me, it was really happening on a lot of levels. Still a little bit scared. I wanted to do good for him, you know. But I did know him a little bit. But it was very exciting. Nice, nice. And what is it to be? When you do records with no practice, you know, that's a trip. Oh, totally. It is a trip. But I, like I said a little earlier, I found out music is about taking turns. So I think the more roles and the more open-minded that you sincerely believe everybody's got something to teach you, you're going to bring you and your base to a lot of good, healthy, learning sitches. Mm -hmm. And that's going to the next time you play. Maybe without them, maybe with other cats. And maybe you're part of, you know, they don't know who you've been listening to. You don't know who they've been listening to. Yeah, the way we all inform on each other. Yeah. And, and, and down the years, too. He was telling us about Leon Russell bringing him from Tulsa. <laughs> wow. You know, to play and, and Mad Dog Englishman, right? J J Jim Gordon was the other drummer man. Yeah, yeah. It, you know what it was? It was it was trippy. It was about people. There was a little bit about gear, but not as much about gear as so much about the people and the personas and the uh, kind of experiences in, in human interactions. They really were interesting. And I think it kind of went into the record. Mm hmm. Totally. Well, and, and as we look ahead, because again, this is a fairly recent release, any plans to tour on it or what do we, what are we looking at in the future? He ain't really touring, right? So, but the MSSV projects, mm -hmm. so that's two thirds of Keltner to get a while. Yeah. And I know Mike wants to keep kind of distinct. So like when we first toured together with Hodge, we did do some Wall of Flowers. I think he's already right because we did make a second MSSV album at the end of that tour. In fact, that was the most bitching. I've always made records before the tour. <laughs> right? And, you know, you're just getting it together. Yeah. Then you do a tour, you get it all tight and stuff, but too late. It's already made. Yeah, yeah. Such a great strategy. Mm -hmm. You do pretty eight straight gigs. We got all the music done in one day. Nice. Nice. You know, because of all, they were like pracs. In fact, real pracs, because they're in front of people. <laughs> Absolutely. Prac to do those, but the real prac is in front of people. And yeah, we had it so down. It is such a great strategy to record at the end of a tour. Now, the thing is, you're always like, I guess you're giving audience material they don't know of. Who's could do used to do that? They yeah. always play the next album nobody heard. <laughs> Anyway, what what is that? Yeah. yeah what is it? Well, I just bought this record. Why are you playing any of those songs? <laughs> well, we're not jukeboxes. Good point. There you go. Because what you were saying about later, because of the situation, the gig goers had a lot to say. It wasn't just the people making music. The gig goers and the listeners had a big say. Yeah. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think that's things when things really change. I think people on the stage are always, somebody's trying something. Mm hmm. When the audience gets brave, when the gig goers, when the, you know, which could be other musicians when they're not playing. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And and I know since we've been talking about this, some people may be going, where can I find out more about this? And the information they gave me to look at MikeBagetta.com yes. is a good place to go. MainstreamStepValve.com. Stop Valve. Stop Valve. Yeah, Mainstream Stop Valve. It's MSSV all spelled out. It's gotcha. from a line in the sand pebbles, this book that Richard McKenna wrote. Actually, there was a movie version made of it with Steve McQueen. It was me and Dee Boone's favorite movie. So Mike Baguetta kind of liked this. He, okay, I'll, we'll call the projects. I, I remember the sand pebbles well. We come from well, the same. Rico, the Japanese actor, Steve McQueen is like, because they're just teaching him how to copy things. Yeah. You know, musically, we can refer to this. Here's how you do this licking. No, no. I want you to know. The thinking behind it, and he uses dragons as a metaphor. When the dragons get tired, the steam, you know, wears down, you got to put it through the condenser and get the steam back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Stem strong. Yeah, men stem stop. Wow. Yeah, that's really, yeah. Because he has, a, he has a eureka moment. Yeah. He's not just copying moves. Now he's got knowledge, and knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pohan, whole man, Pohan, his protege, yeah, he actually sees part of himself in that coolie guy. It was a great human moment. That's the, it's the only book Richard McKenna wrote. He had a heart attack, died young and stuff. He did 23 years in the Navy as a machinist mate like my pop. But Mike McKenna, re- relating to that, you know, Mike McKenna reminds me of a lot of the young people. people. I know there's a lot of people, all these younger people don't know anything that we knew in our days and all. And try to write them off, but in some ways they are so much more open-minded than we are. Hmm. Yeah, because I think ageism was way more a, a deal in those days. Especially they marketed rock and roll as a young music, right? Yeah. Jagger's just seventy-nine now. You can't do that. Yeah. Which is kind of good because music is music. I love rock and roll. Yeah. But you know, yeah, life happens. <laughs> you get a little younger, <laughs> but you just have to quit because the marketing man has a tough job with that. No, no. So I think people let down. So you got a guy in his early 40s organizing a band for, you know, one guy's 80, you know, the other guy's in his middle 60s. Why not? Yeah. I think that's really a good thing that speaks to younger people. Of course, everything's not solved and fixed and all that. But, man, just, just a little more open-mindedness. You know, I remember seeing this video of Bobby Dylan in the 60s getting a, a award from these people, and he said, you're all old. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, maybe yeah. that's those days because <laughs> what can you do about that yeah 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 so the, this thing about yeah the who right my generation I just think that it was just a thing of those days the way circumstances were and now we're in these circumstances and maybe it's safe enough where we, the age groups can come together it's okay yeah well, and the fact that we're living, lo- you know, in general, living longer lives, yeah, yeah, that has a lot more of us, a little more senior gray-haired folks yeah. out there. And I'll never forget when we took our son to see Aerosmith, yeah. and my son looked around at the crowd and he said, what are all these old people doing here? <laughs> and it's like, this is our music. This is why it is the old people are here. But anyway, Mike... Tremendous. What did, what did he think of the band? Oh, loved it. I mean, okay. you know, what, what's not, what's not, it's, what an amazing show. And of course, it, it was, oh my gosh, it's been like decade and a half ago, but, you know, it, everybody. You know, what I, you know what I heard about stuff like rocks and that low riff thing? Mm hmm. They doubled Defender 6. Oh, wow. You know what they use tic tac bass on cowboy stuff? Mm-hmm. They actually use this with hard rock, doubling the guitar lines with the baritone guitar. Oh wow! Yeah, for that big bottom kind of thing, and yeah, bass sneak up on you. I know Jack Bruce. The first year of Cream, he played a Fender Six. God, the strings are so close together. <laughs> so close together. It's got a whammy bar. Absolutely. Well, and talk about getting people upset. Start putting more than four strings on a bass, and you're gonna hear you know half of that the the crowd on that forum you'd mentioned before howling at the moon because there's too many strings. I remember the first five string. It, it was on, it was on some Led Zeppelin posters. John mm. Paul Jones played one. Mm. It wasn't a B string. Leo brings on a C string. He don't want us going up the neck. In fact, he gives it only 14 frets. Wow. But an interesting thing he did, he switched the stagger on the pickup, which is where I got the idea for the Mark II watt plow. There you yeah, go. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Leo. God, thank you so much on that. So many thanks. A guy who didn't even play, just wanted to help his music friends. Yeah. Well, hey, it takes takes all kinds. takes a village, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I dig that. I dig that. Anyway, Mike, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to share with us. We're very excited about every When We Go, folks. Make sure you check it out at all the places we've indicated. You've seen him here, Mike Watt on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you so much, Raul. You're the best. (laughs) 